In the yester years of centuries ago, in a small portion of this vast world of ours, there lived a people called the children of Israel. From them came certain men and women through whom God revealed himself to all mankind. One of these was David, king of Israel. David of Bethlehem, conqueror of the giant Goliath, and once the favorite of King Saul, was hiding in the wilderness of Judah, living in a cave like a hunted animal, because the king was jealous of David and wanted to kill him. But David was not alone. Some 400 men from all over Israel joined David, men who were dissatisfied, in trouble, or in debt, and David became their leader. One day, word came to David that some of his people were in trouble. The Philistines have attacked Keilah and are robbing the people of their grain. Shall I go and fight these Philistines? If we're afraid here in Judah, how much more than if we go to Keilah? David's men were afraid to come out of their hiding place because King Saul would find out where they were. But as always, David turned to God for guidance. Shall I go and fight these Philistines? Then God gave David his answer. Go down to Keilah and fight, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. Confident of what God wanted him to do, David no longer hesitated. He got ready for battle. When King Saul heard that David and his men had defeated the Philistines at Keilah, he was sure that now he could capture David. God has given David into my hand, for he shut himself in by entering a town that has walls and gates. Tell all my soldiers to get ready to go down to Keilah. We will surround David and his men. He shall not escape me this time. But once again, David was protected, for God had warned him of Saul's plan. So David and his men hurried out of the city of Keilah and hid in the wilderness of Zip. Here, one day, David had a happy meeting with his dear friend Jonathan, the son of King Saul. Don't be afraid, for my father will not find you. You will be king of Israel, and I'll be with you. My father also knows that this is so. If your words prove true, Jonathan, and I am king someday, then I'll keep my covenant with you. You'll always be my closest friend, and nothing shall come between us. I swear it before the Lord. So David and Jonathan renewed their vows of friendship. And though they were never to see each other again, David would always treasure the memory of this prince who had been a loyal friend, even at the risk of his father's anger. David and his men wandered from place to place, hiding in the woods or in mountain caves. And wherever they went, Saul followed with an army of several thousand men. One day, it happened that King Saul and his army passed near a cave in the wilderness of Angedi, where David and his men were hiding. And Saul himself went into the cave, not knowing that farther back in the same cave was the man he was hunting. Here, 
in the darkness of the cave was David's chance to get rid of his enemy, or so David's men believed. Well, this is the day in which the Lord told you when he said, I will turn your enemies over to you, and you can do with them what you'd like. But all that David would do was to creep up and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. Then he went back into the shadows of the cave. When David refused to harm Saul, his men wanted to kill the king, but David wouldn't let them. The Lord has forbid that I should lay hands on the one whom the Lord has anointed to be the king. Why do you listen to these men who say David is trying to harm you? Today you can see how the Lord delivered you to me in the cave. My men wanted me to kill you, but I spared your life. See, my Lord, the corner of your robe is in my hand. You can see that I don't intend to kill you or rebel against you. I cut off the corner of your robe, but didn't kill you. I haven't, I haven't sinned against, against you, you, though you, you hunt, hunt me and are trying to kill me. May the Lord punish you, but I will not lay hands on you. You are a better man than I, for you have done good, and I have repaid you with evil. May the Lord reward you for what you've done to me this day. I know you will certainly become the king. And the kingdom of Israel will become powerful under you. Once again, David's love and loyalty had softened Saul's heart. So for the time being, the repentant king forgot his jealousy and returned home with his army. However, just as before, Saul's change of heart lasted only a short time. He was soon back with his army, searching for David in the wilderness of Ziph. But again, God showed that he was on the side of his faithful servant David, when he caused King Saul and all his men to fall into a deep sleep. And while they slept, David and his nephew, Abishai, entered the camp and made their way to where Saul was sleeping. God has sent your enemy to you. Let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear, and I won't have to try a second time. Don't kill him. For who can harm the one whom the Lord has made king and not be punished? As the Lord lives, the Lord will punish him. The day will come when he will die a natural death or die in battle. The Lord forbid that I should lay my hand on the one whom the Lord anointed. Take his spear and his water jug and let us go. Then David went to a hill on the other side of the valley and called down to Saul's men telling them that they hadn't guarded their king well, for they had let an enemy come into the camp and take his spear and water jug. When Saul awoke and heard David's voice, he realized that David had again spared his life. Once more, the king felt ashamed, 
and promised to stop trying to kill David. My son, I have sinned. Come back, David. I will not try to harm you again. But King Saul had broken his promises too often. David could no longer trust him. And so David left the country of Israel and went to live in the land of the Philistines. There he was to stay with his family and his faithful followers as long as Saul remained king. For more than a year, David stayed in the land of the Philistines. Then one day, a messenger came from the land of Israel with the news that Saul was dead. Having died on the battlefield, Saul's royal crown and armband were brought to David. Now David forgot all the evil the king had done against him, and he sincerely mourned for him and for his friend Jonathan, who had died in the same battle. How the mighty are fallen. How the mighty are fallen. After Saul's death, David lived in Hebron. There, the elders of Judah had anointed him. But seven years passed before all the other tribes of Israel were ready to anoint him as their king. When Ishbosheth, another son of Saul, died, the elders of the people came to David in Hebron. Even in the past, when Saul was our king, it was you who led Israel into battle. And the Lord told you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So once more David was anointed to be king, this time over all the 12 tribes of Israel. So God's purpose in sending Samuel to anoint David many years before was now fulfilled. Now David was ruler over a great people, and God blessed him and gave him many victories over his enemies. But David remained humble and God-fearing and honored God in all things. David's love for God led him to build a new tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant and to bring the Ark to Jerusalem. A great crowd of Israelites gathered to celebrate the moving of the Ark. This was a happy day because the Ark was a sign of God's presence and many hadn't seen it since its capture by the Philistines. But though the Ark had been brought back to Jerusalem, David wasn't satisfied. He gave his reasons to Nathan, a prophet. I am living in a cedar palace, and the ark of God is kept in a tent. What is on your mind? I want to build a temple to honor God, a beautiful house of the Lord in which to worship him, and a place to keep the ark of the covenant. Go. Do everything you have in mind, because the Lord is with you. That same night, however, the Lord spoke to Nathan, revealing that not David, but David's son would have the honor of building the temple. And Nathan told David all this, and also God's wonderful promise for David's son. He shall build a house for my name, and I will make the throne of his kingdom stand forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he sins, I will punish him, but I will not take my mercy away from him as I took from Saul. Your royal house and your kingdom will stand forever. As David listened, he was filled with gratitude and went into the tabernacle to pour out his heart to the Lord in prayer. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have blessed us so much? And yet even this you consider not to be enough. You have given me great promises for the future of my family. Yes, future generations would carry on the work that David had begun. 
And in this promise, David was content. His son Solomon would someday build a beautiful temple as a house for the Lord. And still another descendant of David, the Messiah, would one day build a more lasting structure, a spiritual temple that would last forever. God's church in the hearts of his people. Thank you.